All right, so welcome to Math 150, Multivariable Calculus. This is lecture 25. And what we're going to be doing today is we're going to be doing some convergence tests. So we've already talked a little bit about the comparison test. If you are able to use the comparison test, it's one of the easiest tests possible. You, know, you have a sequence of non-negative terms and less than equal to term by term, something that converges, so it converges. Actually, it doesn't have to be less than or equal to term by term. There can be finitely many exemptions. If I, if the first couple of terms are larger, but then from say the 15th term onward, it's always smaller, that's fine. I just need from some point onward, it's always less because if I have finitely many terms, what is this finite sum of finite numbers? Well, can you tell me about a finite sum of finite numbers? It's finite. So it's not going to affect whether or not things converge or diverge, right? So if I have your 114 or 115 terms and I throw them away, it's not going to affect whether or not the sum converges or diverges. Similarly, if I'm larger term by term than something that diverges, then I diverge. What if I'm smaller a couple of times in the beginning? Does it matter? All that matters is from some point on, because if I have an infinite sum that diverges, if I throw away a couple of terms in the beginning, it's still going to diverge. So for the sum of one over n, if I throw away the first you know, 24,601 terms, then what's left over is still going to diverge. All right, so now, have we talked about the alternating decreasing test? We have a series of terms that alternate in sign Okay, so we'll, we'll do the alternating decreasing, then we'll do the integral test. And if time permits, we'll state the ratio of the root test. So imagine we have a sequence an such that the absolute value of an is always greater than the absolute value of an plus one, and the signs alternate. So theorem conditions as above. the sum of a n converges. I'm going to do a proof by picture. So here is maybe a one. Let's say a one is positive and I go up a certain amount. Now I add a two, which is negative and is a smaller in absolute value than a one. So what can you tell me about a one plus a two? What can you tell me about A1 plus A2? Less than 2A. Why is it less than 2A1? It's definitely going to be less than 2A1 because you know, 2A1 is going to be a positive number greater than A1. You know, we started at 0. We then added A1. And now we add A2, which is negative. So we're coming down from A1. How far down can we come from A1? The value must be greater than zero. So we come down, we don't go all the way down. We would come down to maybe over here. We can't come all the way down to zero. We can't go into the negatives. Well, now let's add in A3. A3 is positive, so it's going to go up. Can you go all the way back up to A1? Why not? Its absolute value is less than A2, so the amount we get back can't be enough to go all the way up. Yes. It's going to be an oscillation. And the upper bound is always going to be getting smaller. The lower bound is always going to be getting higher. So now when I do A4, I come down, but not as far. When I do A5, I come up, but not as high. And so you can see that the upper bounds are always getting smaller. The lower bounds are always getting higher. And the distance between the upper and the lower bounds is at most the next term in the sequence. So what is the difference between the upper and the lower bounds going to? It's going to zero. So we can see that you're between A1 plus A2 plus A3, the difference between A2 and A3 is at most, is in fact, is exactly equal to A3. 
the difference between a one plus a two plus a three and a one plus a two plus a three plus a four is exactly a four. So the difference between subsequent upward lower bounds is just the last term of the sequence. And since that's going to zero, the upper and the lower bounds converge to each other. So upper minus lower is just the terms in sequence tend to zero. Is this enough detail that if we have an alternating series that will converge? So for example, if I give you the sum and it goes from one to infinity, one over n, converge or diverge? Diverges. But what if I give you the sum and it goes from one to infinity of negative one to the n over n? That will converge. And this actually has a nice answer. It's related to the natural log. So when we get to Taylor series, we'll see some nice applications of this. All right, so this is the alternating test. So two things must be true if you want to use the alternating test. The signs must alternate plus minus plus minus plus minus, or if you want to be a rebel, minus plus minus plus minus plus. And each term must be strictly less than the previous. What if they weren't strictly less than? Would it have to converge? What if we just had a n plus one? Well, it's a n was greater than or equal to a n plus one, and signs alternate. Must the sum of a n converge? Give me an example. Yeah. Plus one minus one, plus one minus one. So if they don't decrease, then we don't know that the gap between them is getting small. And so you're always, 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 whenever you see conditions, remove a condition and try to find a counter. That's the best way to really understand it there, is that the condition should matter or it should at least simplify the value. So when we proved the fundamental theory of calculus, what did I constantly resort to when I was proving it? It was my go-to theorem for calculus. Lecture was kind of the one with the uh, was the mean value constantly appealed to the mean value. So to prove that the area under the curve y equals f of x was big F of b minus big F of a, to do that, I used the fact that little f was differential. You don't need that assumption for the final. But it makes the proof a lot easier. You don't have to use advanced techniques for your analysis. And most of the functions we look at are differentiable, or at least they're differentiable in pieces. You know, they might be differentiable up to here, where there's a discontinuity. You would have large sections where they're continuous and differentiable, and you can do things with each of these pieces and then add them together. So frequently, it's not really a bad, it's not really a big deal to assume something like that, to assume that your function is differentiable, because most of the functions you're going to apply this to are differentiable. So whenever you have you know, the opportunity to make an assumption, you want to always ask, you know, how bad of an assumption is this? Is this an assumption that's going to be easily bad or is it going to be extremely restricted? Okay, so the next is the interval test. And I remember last time we looked at the sum of one over n squared and goes from one to infinity. We did, you know, a dyadic decomposition. We had like one over two, I'm oh, sorry. We had two to the k less than equal to n less than or equal to two to the k plus one minus one. So one over n squared is one over two to the two k as an upper bound, and one fourth one over two to the two k as a lower bound. And so the sum goes from one to infinity of one over n squared was you know, less than equal to 
the sum t goes from zero to infinity, and then we had this, uh, we had two to the k terms like that, and so that was the sum k goes from zero to infinity of one half to the k respect to k. So this is you know, the quick recap of what we did. This was a hard problem is we had to break things up into blocks. Each block was twice as big as the previous. And then we said, look, the function one over n squared, it's not really changing a tremendous amount with this block. And by tremendous amount, I mean order of magnitude. You know, one fourth versus one, that's the same order of magnitude. We're not going from one fourth to a billion in one block, and then one fourth to a billion in the next, and then one fourth to a multiplex in the next. It's staying pretty much fixed as to what the size is. So we want an easier way to prove that this converges. And more generally, we had a P series. This is where a n is one over n to the P, P is greater than zero. If P is greater than, oops, P is greater than one, it converges. If P is less equal to one, it diverges. And that was the main result of the P series. And we were able to prove this by clever grouping. But what I want to do now is I want to prove it by using the integral test. So for the integral test, we have a sequence a n that is either non-increasing or non-decreasing. So what does it mean to be non What is something that's not, what does it mean to be non increasing? Good. At every moment in time, it's either the same or small. Can somebody give something associated to yourself that's non increasing? The only thing I can think of right now is the unpleasant. Time left in the day. That's much better. Mine was you know, time until you die. Time left in the day is a much happier uh, way of looking at it. Or maybe, you know, time until we will have no more snow this spring. Those of us who are here earlier were looking at your brother advisory coming in for tonight. So that would be something that's not going to increase. You're not going to all of a sudden have seconds added unless when. Yeah, for daylight savings, there is one moment in time where you could actually get it. But other than that, can somebody give something associated to yourself that is non decreasing? Age. What about weight? That would typically go up and down. So most things are not going to be non increasing or non decreasing. But a lot of the sequences we look at are either non increasing or non decreasing or they're not increasing, not decreasing from some point onward. It's okay to have a couple of terms that are fluctuating and then from that point onward. So here's how it works. I'm gonna do it by an example. So let's consider the sum n goes from one to infinity of one over n. One, two, three, and minus one, I'm not going to draw things to scale. At one, a n is equal to one. At two, what would I get? One half. What I get at three? You're about one third. All the way up to one over n minus one, one over n, and so on. So if I want to figure out the sum of one over n, so much of math is just being able to do algebra. I'm going to write this as one over n times one. Does that change the sum if I multiply every term by one? No. 
how can I view one over n times one geometrically? That's the area of what? So what has area one over n times one? And don't give me some strange circle with a strange radius involving it. What nice shape has area one over n times one? Yeah, all the rectangles. So for the first rectangle, if I go and take a rectangle of height one, and then the second one, I take a rectangle of height two, and then a rectangle of height three. And now what I can do is I can draw a function f of x such that I want f of n to be a n. And if I choose the right function, the area under f of x is going to be less than the area of the boxes. Anybody have an idea of what we should choose for the function f of x? I want f of n to be a n, which for us here is just one over n. So try f of x equals One over x. Almost always let the index equal x. That's almost always going to work if you try to find a function. You give me a function a n. Okay, let me just try replacing every n percent x and call that my function f of x. So now, what do we have? We have the sum. N goes from one to, oh, sorry, let's do, I'm going to make these a capital N. N goes from one to capital N of one over N. That's going to be greater than or equal to the area under the curve um, one to, say, capital N. I could actually do a little bit better. Where should I really integrate up to? Yes. I really should integrate up to n plus one. So I'm going to just integrate up to n. It's not going to really change things because it's going to give me a lower bound. And this will be a little bit easier to work with. But you could really do n plus one. And that would just give us a little bit better of an estimate. I'm just one of the blackboards, so I'm going to make my life a little bit easier. Okay, so we found a way to view the series with the function f of x giving us a lower bound when we integrate. Can you find a way to view the series so that f of x will give you an upper bound? So we chose the boxes going to the right, and then f of x gave us a lower bound. What could we try? going to the left. And so if we do it that way now, here's the first box, here's the second box, here's the third box. And now f of x is going to be an upper bound. But what do we have to be careful about? So when you look at what's going on, we are going to get an upper bound, but the first box is special. We don't want to integrate from zero. And that's putting in a tremendous amount. So what we would say here is that this is going to be less equal to the integral from one to n of f of x dx plus the area of the first box, which is one over one times one. So I'm just adding in that one extra box. So this is how the integral test works. We have our integral one to n is basically the same as our sum up to the area of the last box. If we did a little bit better, if we did integrating from one to n plus one, 
students with a little bit more work. We would have the integral from one over n plus one f of x dx is integral from one to n of f of x dx plus the integral from n to n plus one of f of x dx is thus equal to the sum and goes from one to n of one over n is thus equal to the integral from one to n of f of x dx plus one. So now we would get that our sum is the integral of one to n of f of x dx. And the amount that we can be off by, we now know it's somewhere between adding the integral of f of x dx from n to n plus one to that, or one to n. So I can do a little bit better. So for our problem, if f of x equals one over x, what is the antiderivative of one over x? So what function has derivative one over x? Natural log. Natural log of x. So we get, the first one is going to be the natural log of x evaluated at one and n. And if we want to be a little bit more careful, the natural log of x evaluated at n and n plus one is less equal to the sum and goes from one to n of one over n is less equal to the natural log of x at one and n plus one. What's the natural log of one? Zero. So we would get the natural log of n plus the natural log of n plus one over n is thus equal to the sum and goes from one to n of one over n is thus equal to the natural log of n plus one. All right, as n gets very, very large, what's the natural log of n plus one over n? What does that go to? So what does n plus one over n go to as it gets really, really large? Close to zero, no. Well, n plus yeah, one. n plus one over n goes to one. One, and the natural log of one is zero. zero. So this piece is going to zero. So basically, the sum of one over n, n goes from one to n, is thus equal to the natural log of n plus one, and it's greater than equal to the natural log of n. So this means we're localizing the sum of one over n to within one unit. Because the natural log of n is going to infinity, this is impressive. So is anybody following the Twitter sweepstakes? About Elon Musk is trying to buy Twitter and now some people are trying to potentially stop him and Twitter might be issuing some types of stock and now he's trying to get these. So there's a lot of interesting stuff that's gonna go on right now. If you're trying to figure out how much money is involved in buying Twitter, what, what level of money are we talking about? Billions, okay. If you're off by a dollar in your estimate of how much you need to buy Twitter, is this really going to matter? No, with something going off to infinity like this, being off by one, this is phenomenally close. You might've heard the phrase, you know, close only counts in. What? Horseshoe, uh, I heard horseshoes and thermal nuclear war. But for certain things, being close is, is good enough. You know, being off by one out of a billion percentage wise, that's so small. This gives you the power of the integral test. So not only is this telling us that a series converges or diverges, but it's giving us when it converges a really good estimate of the value. We're off by essentially the last value. Let's consider the sum n goes from one to infinity of one over n squared. What should my function f of x be? So we have a sequence which is not increasing. What should my function f of x be? 
1 over x squared. And we would get uh, for any big N, the integral from 1 to N of f of x dx is thus equal to the sum and goes from 1 to big N of 1 over N squared is thus equal to the integral from 1 to N f of x dx plus the first term, which is 1 over 1 squared times 1. Is everybody comfortable that essentially all I did is I replaced 1 over n with 1 over n squared? It's the same argument as before. We did this for any fixed n. We can let n go to infinity. So let n go to infinity, and we find the integral from 1 to infinity of f of x dx is thus equal to the sum n goes from 1 to infinity of 1 over n squared is thus equal to integral from 1 to infinity of f of x dx plus 1. All right, so let's figure out what this integral is. So this is the integral from 1 to infinity of x to the negative 2 dx. What function has derivative x to the negative 2? What function will have derivative x to the negative 2? Negative 1 over x. Negative 1 over x. So this is equal to negative 1 over x at 1 and infinity. So I can flip the order by putting in the minus sign. And right, so this is just one. So we get one is thus equal to the sum and goes from one to infinity of one over n squared is thus equal to two. So similar to the last problem, we have an uncertainty interval of size one. How do you feel about this? Not nearly as good because you know one is a huge fraction. Let's look at this a little bit more. Are you impressed with the lower bound? Sum is at least one. So lower bound size. Why is it so bad? Yes. Note the sum of one over n squared n goes from one to infinity equals one plus you know one fourth plus one ninth. So getting a lower bound of one is not that impressive. If I tell you the probability of something happening is at most two hundred and thirty percent, it's an accurate statement. It's also completely useless. So this is not a good lower bound. The correct answer is pi squared over six. It is somewhere between one and two, but a lower bound of one is just not that useful. So any thoughts about how we could make this better? Any thoughts about that? So it equals pi squared over six, which is approximately 1.644. Sorry, yes. No, it is related to the Riemann zeta function. It's, it is not geometric. The geometric would be like one over two to the n. This is one over x squared. So here's how you could make it better. Do one plus one fourth plus one ninth plus one sixteenth plus 1 25th plus the sum and goes from 6 to infinity of 1 over n squared. What if I did that? So now if I wanted to try to figure out you know, what is you know, the sum of 1 over n squared, well, I would have you know, the integral from 6 to infinity of 1 over x squared dx is thus equal to the sum and goes from 6 to infinity of 1 over n squared is thus equal to the integral from 6 to infinity 
in front of x squared plus now what would be the area of the first box it would be one over six squared times one what's the interval of one over x squared that's negative x inverse when we evaluate it six infinity is one sixth so we would get one sixth is less than equal to the sum and goes from one to infinity of one over n squared is less than equal to one sixth plus one over 36. So this would allow us to evaluate the sum to within one over 36. So all I would need to do now is just add Twelve sixty one over nine hundred. So we get twelve sixty one over nine hundred, which is approximately one point four over nine. So this part over here. So what I need to do is I need to take this and I need to add one sixth. So the sum n goes from one to infinity of one over n squared is equal to 1261 over 900 plus one six plus an error at most one over 36. So if I add, So this is about 1.567 by 36, about 0.027. If I look at what I had before, 1.64, hopefully that should be within the range. Looks like I'm a little bit below. Did, did, did I forget the 116? Yeah, I was about to say it. There we go. I forgot the 116. All right. So it's one. That's the fast way of fixing it. And then take the measurement to one sixth. Let's see what we get. Let's see what And that is now within the correct range. So for the integral test, it's extremely powerful. It tells you whether or not something converges or diverges, and it can give you a really good estimate on the answer. If you have a sum of terms that's converging, well, if it's converging, the beginning part of the sequence is what's going to give you most of the meat. And so if you just do a couple of terms in the beginning, and then use the integral test to approximate what's left over, you can get a pretty good estimate. And so now we're within you know, 0.02 by just summing you know, five terms and doing an integral. How far would I have to go to be within 0 0.01? So I wanted my error to be about 0 0.01. How far would I have to go? Like 10. Yeah, like 10 terms. And so actually, if I evaluate the first nine terms, 
and my error would be one over the temp term. And so just evaluating nine terms would get me you know, two digits of accuracy. So this is going to converge slowly, but it will converge. So more generally, I could give you the sum n goes from one to infinity of one over n to the p is the sum n goes from one to infinity of n to the negative p. Let's say p is greater than zero. So this is a p series for power. And so this is clearly a non-increasing sequence. So we can do the integral test. So the sum n goes from one to infinity of one over n to the p converges if the integral from one to infinity of one over x to the p converges, diverges if the integral from one to infinity of one over x to the p diverges. So we just have to figure out if the integral converges or diverges. If the integral converges for some value of p, it converges for all values of p greater than that, by what test? So we converge which one? Comparison test. Because as p gets larger, the denominators get larger, so the sum gets smaller. So if it converges for some value of p, so we know it already converges when p is greater than or equal to two. If you do the integration, you'll see that it converges for any p greater than one. We know it diverges when p equals one, and so any p that's smaller makes the denominator smaller, which makes the fraction larger, so the sum is larger, so it will diverge. So you just need to show if p is greater than one, show the integral from one to infinity of x to the negative p dx is finite. And so that's just a straightforward integral that we can now evaluate. Any questions on the integral test? So it all comes down to trying to figure out which sums converge, which sums diverge. So here is a fun view. Consider the sum and goes from, let's say 10 to infinity of one over n natural log of n and the sum and goes from 10 to infinity one over n natural log of n squared. Any thoughts about what function I should use? What function should I try? One over x log x. And for the other? So the convergence of the sum depends entirely on these intervals. Why do you think I'm starting at 10 and not at 1? But I only care about if it converges or diverges. Why don't I want to start from the Yes. So, I mean, again, it's enough to start at 10, I could start at a million. But there's a reason why I didn't want to start at one. What would happen if n equals one? Yeah, there's a zero in the denominator. It's really not hard to figure out if the sum converges or diverges if I start off with one over zero. Right? So, it's only interesting if the denominator is not zero. So, let's start off at 10. But for this case, we would have to integrate uh, from 10 to infinity, 1 over x log of x dx. And here we'd have to integrate from 10 to infinity of 1 over x log of x squared dx. So now we actually have to remember our calculus. So the multivariable calculus part of this problem is now done. Yeah, the multivariable calculus, or the sequences in series, was just to set up the integral test. Now we have to do the resulting integral. 
So any thought about how we should integrate one over x log x, you have to remember your calculus. Yes. U substitution. What should we take u to be? Good. And what should we take u to be on the other one? Yeah, log of x. So it's the same for both. And then we would get du is 1 over x dx. du is 1 over x dx. As x goes from 10 to infinity, u goes from the log of 10 to infinity. Same. We get the integral from the log of 10 to infinity. Now, 1 over x dx is going to just become the du. So this is just du over u. And this is log of 10 to infinity of du over u squared. So what can you say about the first integral, the du over u? Infinite. So this is just going to be the natural log of u evaluated at the log of 10 and infinity, this is just infinity. Whereas this is going to be negative one over u at the log of 10 and infinity, this is going to just become one over the natural log of 10. So this one converges, this one diverges. There's not a huge difference between those two series. One of them is one over n log n, one of them is n log squared. So this example is from Rudin's blue book, or Principles of Mathematical Analysis, or Baby Rudin. You know, these are the common names for this very famous real analysis textbook. As an exercise, you can keep playing these games. And you can consider the sum, and goes from one to infinity of one over n log n log log n versus one over n log n, log, log n squared. What do you think will be true about each one of them? If one converges and one diverges, which do you think is the one that will converge, which one will diverge? So if I, if I tell you one of them converges, you know which one has to converge and you know which one has to diverge. If one converges, one diverges. Which is the one that has to converge exactly one converges? The one on the left, which is which? So you're saying that the, the first one is the one that converges. Sorry, that one that diverges. This one diverges. And this one converges. And you can see the one over n log n log log n is going to be larger you know, term by term. What function would you use for f of x? So for my function f of x, the first thing is that I have to. Yes. Um, And now, what would you do for your u substitution? So you could try log x, log x is not going to work. You need another try. I'm sorry, say that again? Log of log of x. And note, if you do du dx, the derivative of log is one over, so I get one over log of x times the derivative of the inside, which is log of x. So I get one over log x times one over x. So du is one over x, one over log x dx. Ah, that's going to be very, very nice. And that's going to lead to an integral of one over u. So this shows that you, know, you try to find a boundary between converging and diverging. I can have two sequences that don't differ by that much. You know, log, 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 and then all those logs squared. You know, they're not going to change by that much, but it will be enough to push from diverging to converging. 
All right, so this is the integral test. So for the next class, we're going to do the ratio and root tests. And so for the ratio, we're going to let rho equal the limit as n goes to infinity of a n plus one over a n. And for the root, we're going to let rho equal the limit as n goes to infinity of the nth root of a n. And for both of them, if rho is less than one it converges, greater than one it diverges, and equals one no information. So as long as you can calculate these limits, it's actually not that hard to tell if a sequence converges or diverges. In the background, what's lurking behind what makes the ratio and the root tests work is the geometric series. So what's the hardest part of using the comparison test? The hardest part of using the comparison test, what would that be? Finding something to compare it to. So the ratio and the root test compare it to a geometric series. That's what's going on in the background. So it does the comparison for you. And it says, if rho is less than one, I'm going to compare it to a geometric series with a ratio less than one, and it will converge. And if rho is greater than one, it will compare it to a geometric series with a ratio greater than one. All right, so this is a good place to start for today. I want to leave a little bit of extra time so people can pick up uh, papers.